This coronavirus death toll continues to rise and it impacts so many people, but not always equally. Data shows that essential workers, poorer households, and racial minorities are disproportionately impacted. Take New York City. Blacks and Latinos are nearly twice as likely to die from the virus there and thus represent a larger portion of deaths than their share of that population. And let's be clear, this trend goes well beyond any particular big city. It has also been documented in places like Illinois, Michigan, and Kansas. We see similar disparities. Now, medical experts stress that this virus may be technically blind, it's a virus, but our society and the history it's intersecting with are not. Long-standing inequities in the job market, in healthcare access, and in housing make these problems much worse for certain communities. Digging into this important conversation now, I'm joined by Rich Benjamin, political analyst. He's the author of Searching for Whiteopia, an improbable journal, journey, I should say, into the heart of white America, an interesting and prescient book that was written before the Trump era began. And rejoining us, as promised, is Professor Brittany Cooper. She is the author of Eloquent Rage. Uh, thanks to both of you uh, for being a part of this discussion. Uh, this is something that, that we've been covering in a range of ways. Thank you, Rich. Good to see you. We've been covering this in a range of ways. We've, we've talked to doctors. Uh, we've talked to people in affected communities. Uh, we heard from the chief of police in Detroit, who has an overwhelmingly African-American police force and community. Uh, and we've, we've seen this in a lot of ways. Both of you uh, are, are writers, scholars who think and have studied a lot of these larger issues pre-virus. And so, Rich, uh, what do you take from this? Uh, what needs to be done? Well, Ari, sometimes we hear these dramatic statistics about how black and brown people are dying, but we should go back for sooner and look at per capita in terms of ER rooms, in terms of healthcare access, in terms of ventilators. So we didn't just suddenly get to these deaths. There's a long history, there's a long context of these disparity of resources. And I should also mention the flip side of segregation isn't just black and brown people, it's what do white communities look like? How can they marshal local and state and federal resources to advantage themselves in terms of the health care that they get, the better hospitals, the better schools, the better housing that we've seen to impact this virus? Mm -hmm. And Brittany, uh, there's many ways to measure it. One of the difficulties during this time, we, we showed the, the New York Times report, is that the numbers only take you so far. Each person is a life. We struggle. Uh, with how to even reflect that at these times. Um, but one way to think about that we want to report from the APM research, one way to think about this with regard to the systemic structural racial inequities is this statistic. Uh, if these individuals had simply died of COVID at the same rate as white Americans, then right now there would be about 12,000 black Americans, 1,300 Latino Americans, and 300 Asian Americans who would be alive right now today. Every death uh, a tragic loss for the people affected, no matter the color. Um, but that is another way that experts are pointing to literally what, what that means, Brittany. Um, you know, it's super devastating to see those numbers. And one of the things that African Americans knew, if you think about voting behavior in 2016, was that there would be terrible consequences from a Trump presidency and the mismanagement of COVID means that we are 12,000 less African Americans. But I also want to make sure to note that Native American communities are also being ravaged by coronavirus and have the highest per capita rate of infection of any group in the country. Uh, and they're often not part of this conversation. But there are two additional things that I want to say here. One is that when we think about why African Americans are dying at such high rates because of underlying issues that make them uh, have more fatal instances instances is with this disease, I want us to connect that to the killing of Brother Ahmad Arbery in 
February, something that African-American communities have been outraged about of late, because there's been a lot of preaching and moralizing that black people are dying of COVID because we don't take care of ourselves, we don't eat right, we don't exercise. But we're not thinking about the fact that that brother was killed because he was out for a jog, and that that's one of the structural inequities that we have been talking about when we are wondering why we see more of these comorbidities in African-American communities, because the simple act of trying to exercise in public can be the difference between life and death. The mm. other thing is, anecdotally, I'm hearing lots of stories from Black folks about going to get tested and being turned away. And we're hearing lots of anecdotal stories about folks being turned away multiple times, excuse me, and then um, dying or having really terrible consequences from coronavirus. And that is part of the research that we call the racial empathy gap, where in healthcare providers who are certainly on the front lines and are our heroes still have these biases where they don't believe what people of color are saying about what is happening in their bodies. And there's, I think once we get to the other side of this and we can study it systematically, we're going to find out that that turning away of care, that refusal of care and refusal to believe because of these implicit biases and sometimes explicit biases are also leading to this, this cascading amount of deaths. And so mm. tears came to my eyes when you said those numbers, because, um, you know, it's folks who look like me who are, who are being devastated and ravaged by this. Um, and the challenge that we have in this country uh, is that it's precisely because the death, the dead and dying are people who look like me and people who are black and brown that is leading to folks taking this so cavalierly from the president on down. You make several important points, Brittany, including your reference to empathy and the cross-cutting ways that that um, can distort uh, what would be the right thing. If medically the right thing is help as many people as possible within the resources you have or ethically the right thing, uh, people can debate to some degree, but it involves trying to do right by people so we don't have unnecessary death and tragedy. Uh, you're reminding me of the empathy gap here that obviously the United States battled both internally uh, with these disparities we're discussing and also internationally uh, because we struggle sometimes to see a crisis or a threat as real until it starts killing Americans. Uh, and so we had this That's advance right. notice internationally and 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 we missed that in many ways. Um, Rich, for a final thought, I want to share with you another piece of this. Again, there's so many layers. We're just trying to get through some of it. But uh, this is also the statistics. When we hear the talk about, well, we're reopening to some degree, or, yeah, essential workers got to get back out there. Someone's got to deliver your food. But if you're in the creative class or you have a decent job and you haven't lost your job, maybe you could work from home. Fine. And, and provide for your family. No one's blaming you. But let's understand who's taking the risk, Rich. Heroes are hostages, the ABC News headline. Communities of color bear this burden. People of color account for 43% of essential workers in the nation right now, Rich. Yeah, and I want to highlight what Brittany said about empathy. When you have segregated communities residentially, you lack that empathy of the sacrifices that these working class people of color are making. And therefore, those people of color are facing a double jeopardy or even a triple jeopardy. One is economic, the second is a threat of catching the virus, and the third is catching people's anger when they ask them to put on a mask or when they ask them to buy, yes. abide certain rules. And at the leadership at the top, when you have such a mixed, scandalous response to this disease, on the one hand calling it a hoax, on the one hand saying it's very urgent, this confuses people on the ground and it really frays the social tension and the goodwill between people. And we shouldn't be surprised when we have a lack of empathy, not just in terms of the workers, but in empathy, as Brittany pointed out, in the bedside manner, in the treatment, in the testing, in all the dynamics that go if, if when people of color get sick. So it's a huge, huge issue. And we should point out that, you know, it just didn't come from the clouds, it didn't just descend from nowhere. A certain yeah, type right. of lack of leadership is making this empathy gap worse right. and is putting well, people in all kinds of triple jeopardy. And that's why we wanted to make sure to, to continue to convene these reports and different voices and a range of expertise um, so we can keep this in the headlines and to make sure people are thinking constructively about what to do about it. Rich and Brittany, I want to thank you both. I'll see you again.